Kathy okay. Richardson, Jefferson Starship with us today talking about, well, it's about time to yeah. be talking about something new from Jefferson Airplane. First, new Jefferson release. Jefferson Starship. Star 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 oh my yeah. gosh. I did the same. <laughs> I did the same thing. It was the interview last week with a guy in Quebec did the same thing. And I was yeah, watching I it yesterday and I channeled him. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe that happened. Jefferson know, it's, yeah, it's an easy mistake. It is. It's a confusing Jefferson history. Starship. Right, it, it is. Um, Jefferson Starship, Mother of the Sun, coming out August 21st. It's an EP yeah. that's arriving. Uh, yes. Been been soaking up a lot of the the uh, Facebook Lives that members of the band have been doing, talking about everything on this release. The story you have on It's About Time, and, I, and again, in that Facebook chat you did back on Friday, Fred, from yeah. where you're at, you had the sheet of I did. I, already, I, I went and hit it up in my room again, so I could go get it, but it, it, was, but, it was with dead air. You could talk right. to my son. He's here playing Legos. <laughs> mind. That, could, that could be more entertaining in its own way. Also, <laughs> as you were talking about in that interview, you were saying, you know, like, it's getting a little dog-eared. I mean, I don't want you to get too many fingerprints on it or risk getting a, a crease or something in that. Yeah, way. well, only the envelope that it came in. Well, to fill the listeners in, uh, Grace Slick mailed me these lyrics um, a, three sheets of lyrics for this idea of a song called It's About Time that we discussed writing a female empowerment anthem for the for the times and uh, and so she I got this letter from her in the mail um, that with these handwritten lyrics she doesn't do computers she doesn't do cell phones she doesn't do any of that stuff like if you call her on the phone you have to leave a message on it like a cassette you know answering machine mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know um, so it, it is a priceless thing. Only the envelope itself has gotten dog-eared. The, the lyrics are pristine. They have not been, you know, coffee has not been spilled on them yet. So that, that's why I, I just like lock them in a drawer in my bedroom until I figure out what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah. So yeah, the, the origin story on this, you were, you were talking about this in the other interviews about how this came from your hanging out with, with Grace at, yep. while w watching the coverage of, of the women's marches and, mm -hmm. and playing the, uh, playing the other new song that ultimately is on the CP was What Are We Waiting For? You're playing Correct. for her? Yeah, yeah. That time. How long, her. when exactly, I mean, I remember there was the wave of women's marches, was it, uh, was it January 27th? Or it depends yeah. on which, which 2017. one. 2017, yeah, okay. 2017. And so it was, you know, this record's been in the works for quite a while. Um, and we have such a busy road schedule that it's hard for us to get together. I live in Chicago and, you know, some of the guys live in San Francisco, LA, the Sierra Mountains, so it's it's like hard for us to get together in the same room. It's easier for the California guys, less easy for me, unless I get on an airplane, which of course, you know, nobody's doing now, but at, at, you know, during those years, we've been touring so much, playing 70 shows a year, flying over this way, that way, you know, when I get home, it's like I barely have time, you know, I gotta hang out with my kids for a minute, you know? <laughs> right. So it took a while, uh, and it was, What Are We Waiting For was the first song we'd written, I played her that song. She loved it. She said it it, remind, it sounded to her like old, old and new uh, Jefferson, and it really felt on you know on point for for her for the band for this legacy. So I asked her if she would be interested in collaborating on a new song, and you know I, I didn't hear from her for several months, and I was very surprised when I received <laughs> this amazing, like an envelope of lyrics from Grace Slick. And it's like, oh my God, wait, you know, I here she is over my shoulder. She's like, she's watching over me. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that's so. You have the lyrics. You then are working on the road with with Jude coming up with chords and doing some additional writing. What it yeah. uh, what kind of he, I mean, and I'm watching his video. I would encourage anyone to, if you want, want to get a good idea of how to play the guitar, Jefferson Starship style, <laughs> modern 2020, watch his video. I was just watching that like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah he's got Jim all gold. Is, he's a monster. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Way. It's incredible. Um, yeah. Your contribution to the song, what parts did you write in this one? I actually wrote quite a bit of it. Um, I wrote the chorus. The, I wrote the chords for the chorus. Um, and I did take bits and pieces of the lyrics that she sent to me for the verses, and I also filled in quite a few of those, the melody. Um, Jude had written the big, the riff, and um, we used those chords for the chords of the, of the verse. So 
it was, you know, I, I didn't have quite a hand in it, actually. Um, I, I wrote a lot of the lyrics. As how, well. So how much writing have you done now in total for anything Jefferson Starship related at this point? Uh, well, I've got co-writes on three, four of the four of the six songs. We actually have two versions of What Are We Waiting For? So it's seven tracks on the EP. Okay. Um, but I, I have co-writes on four of those. Nice. Um, yeah. The two versions, what, is, it, is it like a studio and a live version or acoustic or how are those two different? It's a, sh it's a shortened version and an extended version. Okay. Like originally we wrote it and it had, every chorus was a double chorus and then you know, it was like, oh, that's too long for radio. And I'm like, but it's so good. We don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to add. So we didn't right. edit with the thought of for radio, it needs to be, you know, four minutes or less. So the, the, but when we play it live, we do a whole psychedelic freak out at the end, which is very um, Jefferson airplane-ish, a lot of mm -hmm. just feedback and weird sounds. And um, I love, you know, when I, I play, um, 12 string Rickenbacker in the band live on stage at, and it was Paul Kantner's guitar. So when, when he passed away, it was such a big part of our sound. Um, I asked if, if I asked the family, if we could have one of the guitars to play so that we could, you know, so his spirit could still be with us. And so um, China, his uh, daughter gave me the, the black 12 string Rickenbacker that I play and you know, a Rickenbacker is not really a psychedelic uh, <laughs> guitar, and not, not, not the way people think of it. So, I think it's really fun to just get down, turn my amp up all the way, no effects, just the amp reverb, the tremolo from the amp, and just make, start making like, like crazy space sounds out of a guitar and a system that really there's not really much to it. It's so I love that. To me, it's very. Uh, very 60s. <laughs> well, to be fair, that kind of, I mean, you're probably channeling what I'm sure some artists were doing circa 1965, 66, 67, because yeah. they're probably a good number. <laughs> they're playing the Reckenbacher. That was becoming more of a thing back then, circa, you know, Birds and Harrison, what they were starting to do. Well, if you're going to try to do something psychedelic, you work with what you had. And <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of them that are like, well, let's try to do something with a Reckenbacher. So you're probably not that far off, really, <laughs> if you think about I, it. I, I don't think that I am. I mean, for from what I've read and studied about, you know, the originators of rock and roll, you know, the first time they plugged an electric guitar into an amp, that sound, I mean, it changed everything. And uh, getting the feedback and, you know, of course, Jimi Hendrix was really um, instrumental in creating a lot of those weird, crazy sounds, making the guitar do things no one had ever heard before. They really didn't have a ton to work with. You know, a wah-wah pedal, is just um, like a mid-range EQ, you know, that yeah. it's, so it's really, um, I, I think it's amazing what what these bands came up with in those days, just being innovative. Being on, doing it all on the fly, you didn't have the garage band app to come up with a amp <laughs> for you, a psychedelic amp, and you just tap on that, okay, great, but yeah, that's because Apple right. came up with that. That's cool. Um, yeah. Your, you, you mentioned Paul Kantner. Yeah. And in a lot of the other interviews and in your interviews have come up the topic of channeling his spirit, mm -hmm. his whatever, however you can describe something that's ethereal. But Paul yeah. Kantner is, I mean, I, I'm only going to say this for the sake of the interviewers, not for your sake, because you know this. <laughs> Paul Kantner is endemic to Jefferson Starship slash Jefferson Airplane. Without him, this isn't happening, period. Right, exactly. So then we'll try to do the difficult thing. And how do you tangibly describe the spirit of Paul Kantner within the band and the music of the band and the performance of the band to this day, to today? Well, first of all, when we, when we first got together to write um, and we started playing, we just were jamming and... Um, one of the very first things we came up with was a song, What Are We Waiting For? Donnie just starts playing this really amazing groove on the drums, jungly kind of um, toms. And I start playing the chords that became the chord progression. And Donnie starts singing, what are we waiting for? He was thinking of things that Paul used to say all the time because we really wanted him to be part of it. So um, 
he, his actually reason for saying, what are we waiting for? Because he was very impatient. He wanted everything to see, you know, <laughs> what are we waiting for? Why is this next song not starting? So um, it, it was kind of funny, but, you know, um, it, as it's being birthed, you know, um, Jude really was like, you know, what are we waiting for? Social justice, what are we waiting for? This and that. And so I'm like, yeah, that's an amazing idea. So I went home and I wrote the words that start out sort of um, universal, very pulled back in space and time, and then focus in on today and what's going on today. And so we have a very, it's, I guess you could call it politically charged, but I think it's more less political and more of a, a rallying cry for for change, for justice, um, you know, on this planet, which Paul was 100%, that was his whole MO. And all of Paul's songs, when I was uh, growing up as a kid listening to Jefferson Starship and Jefferson Airplane, most of Paul's songs had a bigger message. Um, he was very, in, uh, environmental issues were a big concern to him, taking care of the earth. I mean, that goes way back to, um, blows against the empire T talking about american garbage dumped in space you know just being concerned about all the things that we're doing to abuse the planet so i know that he would be that's one way that his influence has carried forward and um involving some of his his past collaborators like grace um pete sears comes back on the record for three songs that piece uh pete played bass in jefferson starship the original all the way to the end of starship and um, and uh, we have a song that we uh, Chris, our keyboard player, co-wrote with Marty Ballin, um, which is really beautiful. And and I think like Paul, Paul was really into the idea of a collaboration. He wanted the best people. He didn't. It wasn't about him. He wanted people he could harmonize with. He loved the sound of multiple voices ringing together, and especially having a female voice. It was very important to him. So I'm very honored to have been chosen to, <laughs> to fill that spot when it was open. Uh, but so we, you know, with It's About Time, that anthemic chorus, I definitely had Paul in mind, the big three-part harmonies, the social justice, um, you know, is that, is that tangible? <laughs> it, it is. It, okay. it, it does. There's actually even more to unpack from that, I would, I would say, um, yeah. on the social justice theme we've all seen the comparisons of 1968 to 2020 and is it really is it worse is it better what what is it and I mean they're they're different it's multiple generations on so you can't make a direct comparison but mm -hmm. that's been kind of a theme over the past few months of what's happening this year and is there some echo to the late 1960s mm -hmm. so naturally the music of that era is going to start to come up yeah. I've also noticed that if Older acts, acts that have been around a longer time, release new music now, not all the time, but it seems about half the time it's because they have a message, they, they want to put out something. They, got, they really right. have something to say beyond just touring with the old hits. So from right. your perspective, being in a band that has pretty strong roots and connections back to that era, do you, do you feel as though there's some sort of a, some sort of a spiritual or cultural climate return to that era going on in the country right now how would you compare it or how different is it it's so so similar honestly um it's it's amazing and you know we've been feeling this for a while but now here we are in 2020 like three years after we've written these songs and we're like they're they're so these messages are so important we want to say them so we have to get these songs out now we don't care if there's a pandemic and we're not on the road to support the album we want to get these, this music out and so it's funny what are we waiting for it's about time i mean all that it's like this the messages of our songs are urging us to push them forward and i think um you know you see the youth movement um understand you know joining in with the black lives matter protests that's very much like the 60s um but you know, the, I think now, I don't think in the 60s they could have even predicted how weird it was gonna get with, with technology and, the, uh, and social media and how messages can be manipulated. And I think that our, our country's been super manipulated um, and, and 
by forces who want to divide us. I mean, just, you know, we talked about, um, when I talked to um, Mitch LaFon last week, we talked about the whole mask thing, but what is, why is wearing a mask in a global pandemic some like infringement on your freedoms? We're, we're trying to stay alive here, you know? We wanna get back to work, we need to stop this thing. And like, the bla like but it, the messages are, if, if you want to believe that, you're going to find uh, a lot of voices out there, people agreeing with you, which just stirs it up and makes people think it's okay. I'm, I want to go back to the days where racism was wrong and we cared about each other as a country and it didn't matter what political party you were. We could have a civil discourse. We could disagree, but we all really want the same thing. So um, it, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it completely relates to the 60s, it relates back to this band, the, the movement, the youth movement that was going on back then protesting the war. And, um, and so many parallels, uh, it's, it's stunning really. Well, and another thing that I find fascinating with some other concurrent pop music, I think there was a rap album that came out, uh, i trying to think which, which one it was, but it was about a month ago and I'm blanking on the, the, on the artist's name, but it was one of those where the lyrics were composed back in November but it's remarkably timely for today. And this was before a lot of this was happening. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, the culture was brewing, but like the pandemic hadn't started, obviously. Right. There was a lot that was still to come, but it's almost eerie. There've been other songs for that. So I'm curious, when were the lyrics finished for whether they were recorded or not, but when were the lyrics finished for what became the CP? I would say 20, 2017. Wow. 20, yeah. So there, I mean, there you go. Prophetic by three years. Right. You don't even know that that's what's, it, it's going to be yeah. even more timely. This, yeah. this is a recurring theme in, in music right now. I, I keep seeing that. Are you seeing the same thing with other artists too? I, I mean, it's great. I've seen with some of my own songs that I've written uh, unrelated to Jefferson Starship. I, I wrote this song um, in my, my, I have a project called Macrodots with uh, guitarist and producer Zach Smith. And we put out a record and God, what, this was maybe, I don't know. It, it's been a while and I don't know the date on the record, but I'd written a song called Peaceful Protest um, about, I, I was, you know, I was stunned when I saw that the UC Berkeley students or whatever University of California students were protesting peacefully on their knees. And this police officer on camera comes right up and just starts spraying him in the face with a can of pepper spray as if they were bugs that he was trying to exterminate. And it shocked me so much to see that. And it reminded me of Kent State and soldiers actually shooting students who were protesting and killing them, killing Americans. Uh, you know, these kids were not killed, but um, it shocked me so much that I wrote, I wrote the song Peaceful Protest. Um, I don't even know if anybody could find it out there by Macrodots, but um, I, it's such a timely song to this day. I feel like I could take all the news footage and uh, of current times and cut it together and make a, make a new, brand new video that sounded like the song was written yesterday. Wow. And it's, and, it, it's horrifying actually. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want to- Because it keeps happening. <laughs> right, you don't want to find out that it continues that way. Um, and I right. just remembered Run the Jewels is the name of the, of the act that just put out that okay. album. So Run the Jewels is the one that was like eerily prophetic. Also, oh. the sound of Jefferson Starship, when I first heard It's About Time, it was about a, couple weeks ago or whatever the whatever the date was that the song first came out and my first thought hearing that is wow this sounds like Jefferson Starship which I, mean, yeah, I, I know <laughs> and how do you describe I mean and I say this rhetorically how does one describe how a band sounds because bands will bands have certain sounds because either someone plays a certain way or sings a certain way or they have a certain type of instrument but then also there's evolution and and different eras sound different yet there was just something about this that between probably a bit your voice that i mean i hear parts of grace slick in it i'm sure a whole lot is probably a part of how you got the gig you, you, you <laughs> sound like you should be singing songs from jefferson airplane yeah. jefferson starship um also you got members in the band obviously dave freiberg and donnie baldwin they i mean they were there and mm -hmm. the others jude and, and chris they've been okay. in, in it long enough yeah, so, and, we, and, we brought, and we have Pete Sears, too, who was right, very, very of course. big part um, of the sound. By the way, um, which songs does Pete Sears play bass on? Was it three? Which ones does he play bass on? He plays, he plays bass on, what, uh, on It's About Time, 
on uh, Setting Sun and Runaway Again. Okay, cool. Which was um, a total accident. We didn't mean to write another Runaway song, but it, ours is Runaway Again. <laughs> it's quite different. <laughs> well, a pro a appropriate title that way, yeah. Um, yeah. But so obviously, I mean, three members of the early 80s era of Jefferson Starship. Um, right. Right and there's... 70s, I mean, it, David and, and Pete, actually in the band, they would trade playing bass and keyboards all through the 70s, you know. So, um, the, you know, and David's voice, I don't know if people really understand David and Donnie sang background, background vocals on all those records and all those thick harmonies, which is definitely a signature Jefferson sound to me anyway, um, their voices are on those records. So it, it, it definitely, it, it should sound like Jefferson Starship because it is, and uh, but I love the the fact that the song that we wrote sounds like Jefferson Starship, and uh, I really I feel I feel honestly I wrote the chorus, but I I felt like I got Grace's lyrics. I just picked up my guitar and I just started singing. It's about time. It's about time. It's about time. Because she'd written it's about time like a hundred times. And <laughs> like okay, this is the hook. So. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I would still wonder to this day what she had in her mind. Like she probably had some kind of melody in her mind, but she never expressed it to me. She just said, do whatever you want with it. So, but like that, that chorus sounds to me, it reminds me very much of like KBC band era. That was, you know, Cantner, Val and Cassidy after Paul left the Starship and they went and did Starship. He started KBC band, which was an eighties new music version of, but, but with the Jefferson airplane guys. So um, I feel like Paul would love the song and maybe he's the one who put it in my head. Who knows? It's, very, it's, <laughs> it's possible. So I, so how would you describe that, that Jefferson Starship sound? What's the thread or what's the characteristic word, regardless of if it's Mother of the Sun material, whether it's stuff going back to Red Octopus, whether whatever it is, how... It, Singing the songs, how would you describe whatever thread ties everything together? I think I think singing the three part harmonies, the 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 big car choruses, big harmonies, um, just strong songwriting. Um, we don't get too out and too weird. I think the songs are are, but I think the songs are really really strong. Um, although Jude plays uh, his really incredible live version of uh, Embryonic Journey on electric that he adapted from Yorma Kalkinen's Acoustic Embryonic Journey. And that's a really, that's a cool thing. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that going back to what I was starting to say earlier about how Paul wanted to, he always wanted the best person to fill a role in the band and knew, knowing that the sum was, uh, the whole was greater than the sum of its parts. So when Marty Ballin left the band, who's the best singer in San Francisco? The best guy singer, David Freiberg, get him in, you know? Um, and then, and even, you know, it, it, it's always like, you don't like, you hate to see a band member go, but you want to keep the band going. So you just get the next best person that comes along. And Jude happened to be that with us. And I, I had already been playing with me in my band for several years. And I had brought him out to a show. We were playing in Los Angeles where he lives and he came out to a show and Slick, our guitar player, uh, Slick Aguilar, was not feeling well. And he said, tell Jude to bring his guitar. And he comes out to play a song and Slick says, stay here, stay here. And he kept him on stage the whole time. Jude played the whole show. A couple of days later, Slick is finds out he's got hep C and his liver is failing and he needs a liver transplant and he's out. And it was literally like, I, w I had no idea that was happening, I, I, but <laughs> that night I had a dream that Jude was in the band. And I woke up, I go to my email, I see it from the manager, emergency, Slick Aguilar is out. We're getting on a plane in 48 hours to go to Israel, Italy. Like we're going to uh, overseas. We have one show first in, in the US where we're playing a set of Jefferson Starship and a set of Beatles songs because it was a Beatle festival and Jude and I'm like call Jude and the manager goes I already called him and I, and Jude calls me Kathy what should I do and I'm like man I dreamed it you're gonna be in Jefferson Starship it's it's already ordained it's it's already happened so uh and of course Paul loved him to pieces and uh 
he's he's so wonderful it, it, it it's like the i can say the only reason that he didn't get snatched up and taken away by another band was because the perfect time was waiting for him to step into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to my to my final question has to do with the nature of family in that mm -hmm. band. It's a, it's a good segue, and that's something that I've heard repeatedly in the in the recent talks is about how this band, over time, to varying degrees, has been like a family. I think Dave Freiberg said in the Consequence of Sound podcast, um, the one where he unveiled the information about the, the new music that he said, like it feels more like a family now than ever, I think is what, I think that was the one I might be confusing with another. So how would you describe Jefferson Starship today in terms of it being like a family as opposed to describing it as a band? Well, I, I would definitely, call us a family. I mean, we've spent, I've been in the band for 13 years. Much of that time was just spent on the road. So you're traveling together, you're in tight spaces. There's not a lot to do. Uh, you don't know anybody except each other. So just out of that natural habitat, we got so close. And there's not really, I mean, in this group of people, with the exception of maybe me, nobody has a, a very large ego. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> we, and and we, honestly, we, we all agree 99.9% .9 of the time, which is very unusual for a band, I would say. Um, and so we, for, you know, we sort of formed a union together as the musicians, you know, and uh, as the sidemen or whatever, so that when, when Paul passed away and we were given the keys to keep flying the Starship, um, it's, it's been a really harmonious thing. And I think that's what David's talking about. There's not, infighting or my I want my song on the record or turn me up or this or that like it's you know there's a lot of trust we trust each other that we're gonna go out on stage and everybody's gonna do their their job and kill it you know and then when things go weird we like we'll try to actually talk about it like we'll have a little <laughs> therapy session you know uh but, but mostly you know we mostly just really like each other I mean they're these guys are just such great, great guys. And uh, I love being in a band. I love being part of a band. And it's it's just like the fantasy of my life to be in a band, traveling on the road, going out and playing and um, being friends. And, you know, it's it, it's really, we've actually achieved that with this unit, which is, uh, it's such a blessing. Well, five weeks from, I think today, if I'm doing my math right, it would be August 21st is when the EP arrives. Mother of the Sun. I'm That's looking exciting. forward to it. I'm excited to hear what that all sounds like. And especially having all the guys before having Pete back in, all all the eras, you're sounding great. Everyone's sounding great. Thank you, okay. Kathy Richardson, so much Thank for you so much. Taking, Thanks. Taking time. I can't wait for you guys to hear it, the whole thing. It'll oh, be exciting. I mention one more cool thing. I know you're yes. trying to wrap it up. Um, I keep forgetting to tell people about this amazing um, uh, package, this, this CD package that we've created. What is this? My son is giving me a small piece of bacon. I'm going to save that. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, we've created this amazing specialty box. I'm calling it the space box. It, and this young artist, Nicholas Moeller, did these really cool collages of regular life in, with space. And mm -hmm. um, this, when the CD box is folded, it's the size of a regular CD. But when you open it, it opens up into this big box and all these beautiful art pieces around it and the lid actually opens and there's space inside the box. So I can't, I mean, it's so exciting. This is going to be so cool. And I know that the Jefferson fans are going to love it. Ooh, look for that. Absolutely. That's wow. There's even more <laughs> cool stuff. You never need yeah. to know it. Kathy, thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you, Luke. Take care. Enjoy uh, all the, whatever you get back on tour, enjoy that. And we're looking forward to Mother of the Sun. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take Have care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.